Good afternoon or evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is a call to order for January. Are, are we in the 18th or 19th? Do I have an 18th, 18th planning and zoning meeting? And could you stand for the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Clerk, could you do the roll call for me, please? Chairwoman Spidell? Yes, ma'am. Vice Chairman Richardson? Here. Secretary Grant? Here. Member Perez? Member Aton? Here. Member Riley? Here. Alternate Member Faison? Here. Alternate Member Childs? Here. School Board Member Gilbert? Here. Thank you. First thing we have to do is approve the minutes for January 4th, 2023. Do I have a motion? Yes? No? Oh, excuse me. I got to get my glasses straight. I'm sorry. Ms. Riley, would you like to approve yes, the minutes? Yes, I move minutes? that we approve the minutes. Do I have a second? second? Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Member Faison? Yes. Member Childs? Yes. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Chairwoman Spidell? Yes, ma'am. Do we have a notice of procedure this evening from council? Yes, ma'am. All persons who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item must fill out an oath card to be heard on that agenda item and sign the oath contained thereon. These cards are located on the table near the entrance to the council chamber or may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance to the procedures adopted in resolution number 24-1997. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first, those opposed will be heard second, and those who wish to make a public comment on the item will speak third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative from either side, for or against, may cross-examine a witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you desire for the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Please submit such exhibits to the recording secretary. The first item on your agenda is informational and for discussion. And the second item is quasi-judicial. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. The agenda has consent agenda items. That's new business, is that correct? And staff, will you present item 9A for me, please? Yes, ma'am, thank you. Item 9A, accessory dwelling units, begins on page seven of 37 of tonight's agenda. On January 4th, 2023, the commission requested accessory dwelling units or ADU to be a topic of discussion. ADUs are currently permitted with limitations in certain residential zoning districts and close are the city's current ADU regulations. So if you join me on page eight of 37, we have the section of the code It's section 28-351 that highlights which zoning districts ADUs are permitted as a use as a permitted use with limitations and then the list of limitations are in subsection C. So um, I wasn't here when the agenda item was initially brought up, um, but my understanding is that there was a concern that it, it is currently too difficult, um, possibly that there are some barriers to allowing accessory dwelling units. And so if that is the case, uh, you may wish to review the list of limitations and see if there are any that you feel uh, could be uh, either removed or uh, made a little bit easier to, to meet the standard. And where would we find those, sir? That would be on page eight under subsection C. It says standards for permitted accessory uses with limitations. And there's A through H. There's also additional um, for in additional zoning districts, the DMU and IRCN on page nine. Yeah. 
Member Faison, please. Hey, Eddie, how you doing? Good. I can turn your mic off. <laughs> Got a question for you. So are you aware of any other communities in Brevard County that have ADU ordinances? I'm not. Um, I'm sure it's very likely that there are some that allow it. Um, if you'd like, we could do some research and bring that back to the commission. Okay. So the reason, I said, the reason why I said question is because Palm Bay does. Okay. And one of the things that Palm Bay allows to happen is that uh, in our ordinance we have that the ADU should not be more than 25% of the existing dwelling, whereas Palm Bay has 50% of the dwelling. So one of those limiting restrictions would be probably uh, the size of the dwelling. Um, and right now I have Palm Bay's ordinance up <clears throat> right, right now in front of me. And again, one of the things that they also mentioned was, you know, placement of it, of the ADU. For example, no closer than 10 foot from the rear property line, as well as no closer than six foot from the side boundaries. Um, so that's, those are some things that, that Palm Bay has already adopted and that's working well in Palm Bay. Um, another thing that just, I'm not clear on right now, and I'm, I'm trying to, to put this, if, the office, if I was putting this in my own backyard, right? Um, it limits the size of the dwelling to the vegetation re requirement. Um, right now, Titus has a lot of zero lot lines of very, very small, small lots, uh, and I happen to live on one of those. So looking at the vegetation requirement, maintaining the, the tree coverage and, and greenery, um, how is that applied? And if, if, the, if it, given a, a, a lot, standing lot that's my size, would that actually be feasible that I could put a, 400 square foot unit back there, which also that's the other thing too. Uh, Titusville has a limit of 400, uh, excuse me, it can't be no, no larger than 400 square feet or something like that. Did I read that right? I believe that's subsection C1E on page eight. Yeah, minimum 400 and with a maximum of, of 600. Mm -hmm. um, again, just something, some things that we wanna look at again, um, Palm Bay has a, has a minimum of 200 square feet. And again, a maximum of no more than 800 square feet and also or 50% of the of the square foot of the home. Mm -hmm. So those are just, just some things from a community already in Brevard County that's already doing this that I think that Titusville could look at and kind of kind of mimic them if, if we find it to be successful. Member Grant. Yeah, Eddie, since you were here. <laughs> um, I'm curious on what, if you know the rationale on why um, RH, I'm sorry, RMH one's um, accessory structures are not allowed there in mobile homes. Say, for instance, mobile homes. Okay, uh, but mobile homes themselves cannot be accessory structures. I understand all that, but what I don't understand is why can't accessory structures be part of a mobile home park? Or you, you understand what I'm saying? You get it. Um, I don't have the rationale for why that zoning district wasn't included. I could probably speculate that the mobile home is not considered. It is a permanent structure, but it's it it kind of isn't because it rents a lot. Uh, it, it rents the space that it sits on, um, and so maybe it, it may or may not make sense. I would say that the commission is. Welcome to make a recommendation that council include accessory dwelling units in additional zoning districts, such as the RMH one. Um, staff would have to do some more research on whether that's permitted in other jurisdictions and whether that makes sense. Um, I'm not sure whether it is or not. Do you know about the areas you're looking at, whether mobile homes are? No, so so, so many places that I've seen so far, uh, they don't allow mobile homes to be considered a permanent structure. Okay. And so therefore an ADU can't be attached or in the area of a mobile home. And that's the one. And the reason is that if an accessory dwelling, a permanent accessory dwelling unit were constructed and then the mobile home was no longer on the lot, you'd have an accessory dwelling unit without a permanent principal structure. Since we're talking about mobile homes, then clarify how um, Willow Lakes, Willow Lakes is not considered in the city, is that correct? Little Lakes? Willow, Willow Lakes. Willow uh, Five. It's on, is that not, I don't think that's considered in the city. Okay. And neither is the Great Off Doors, is that correct? 
Okay. Sure. So when you have the small, I don't know what you call those dwellings at Willow Lakes or at Great Outdoors, and then they have a enormous um, enclosure over them, kind of a carport for a recreational vehicle. So is that what we're prohibiting within the city? So in this section, uh, subsection D says the use of a mobile home, recreational vehicle, or a similar vehicle as an accessory dwelling unit is prohibited. So if we're talking about uh, in the great outdoors where the structures are primarily uh, mobile structures that are set on a uh, pilings or um, that something like that would not be considered in this section of the code. What we're talking about are permanent structures typically on a slab in the rear yard um, that serve as a secondary living space, either for a family member, extended family member, or um, just an, an additional living space that's on the same uh, lot as the primary, uh, primary structure. Okay, so this would be a situation where you have a house on a lot within one of these areas, and you just happen to have also a large recreational vehicle, and your mother-in-law needs to move in to the well, recreational vehicle. vehicle. Again, the recreational vehicle could not be parked and then lived out of okay. per this section of the code. Okay, nor can it be parked? I think that's another ordinance, isn't it? It is. Okay, okay. Um, Member Richardson. Yes, I have a couple questions. Uh, first of all, uh, what Mr. Faison said, I agree with in, uh, the reduction of the minimum square foot to about 250. I think I see all these uh, things on YouTube. They call them granny flats. They call them all kinds of different mm -hmm. names. But um, with the cost of assisted living, uh, granny flats are, are good alternate. Also, would you kind of explain, I think I know what it means, would you kind of explain under C1C, what you're talking about there? So I'll read it. An accessory dwelling unit may be within or attached to the principal dwelling. Example, a downstairs apartment. Or exist within or as a detached structure, an apartment above a detached garage or a guest house. An accessory dwelling unit attached to the principal dwelling shall have an operative interconnecting door with the principal dwelling and shall have a principal access only from the side or rear yard of the principal dwelling. That's the thing that kind of kind of confuses me because one time when we were on the code enforcement board, I think it was, um, they, somebody wanted an accessory dwelling unit, but it had to be attached somehow. They'll still have to be attached? In this case, it would allow it to be detached. Okay. This ordinance was um, codified in 2020. That case okay. probably preceded it it this was. ordinance. Okay. So a detached guest house is permitted. Correct. Okay. Um, there Member are Faison. And, and, and that's, that's a good part of this ordinance is that it gives the homeowner the option of having it attached and or detached. Um, I think that's that, that's that's awesome. And if the city decides to pass this, they probably should go ahead and make sure that they promote that this is something that's that's here. Uh, for the city of Melbourne, I'm sorry, Palm Bay, when you have added an ADU, they also then tax that home as a multi-family unit. I don't know. So if you guys look at again, if you look at the Melbourne, excuse me, not Melbourne, Palm Bay's ordinance, uh, this is also listed in there as well. And I just want to clarify for the commission that this, like Chelsea said, this or, this language that's being presented to you tonight has already been adopted. It is, it is in effect. Um, and so I think what's being asked is, is there anything that we can do to make it easier to allow these this use, which we currently allow, but there are a number of limitations to it. And so we're open to um, ideas. You don't have to have anything specific. If you generally think that 
we need to look at the the sizes we can compare that to other ordinances and then bring back another recommendation a more specific recommendation um, that then you could forward to city council member Charles so yeah I think I think probably where you're going to is lowering going making the minimum you know 200 or 250 and um, but I also want to know like at because I, I don't know if anyone's looking to do a bigger I don't know if if anyone's want to go bigger but wouldn't um, outside of this ordinance wouldn't the uh, stormwater the whole percolation test that you have to do for your that would have still apply too, right so even if it was less than 25 percent of your entire floor you would of your floor of your house you would still have to you know be you still have to um, be within the ordinance for stormwater control rights so sure there there's certainly a lot of nuances with it there could be a lot within the area area of critical concern the city's uh, well field recharge oh, area where we limit how much impervious surface including walkways AC pads anything that doesn't allow water uh, to drain into the ground um, so we would have to look at impervious coverage for ACC um, for the subdivision certain subdivisions have by lot a maximum of impervious and so there's a lot of things that could, that could uh, get triggered through the development of an accessory dwelling unit. Yeah. I think that lowering it, the amendment would at least be a good start. I don't know if anyone wants to make it bigger, which I think would be. For the council's or commission's discussion, I'd like you all to pay attention to page, the second page of this ordinance because there's also a minimum living area within the IRCNC zoning district that specifically calls out different conditions for that area thank you member grant I was curious, I'll refresh my memory if you can if you can what's the minimum size of a tiny home we have a tiny home ordinance now and I think the I think the max is 600 square feet if my if memory serves but I may be wrong witness sure. oops wouldn't this almost qualify as a tiny home? Just throwing this out there, just to confuse people. So tiny house is a use, it's listed in section 28-80.5. The definition of it is a detached residential unit home with a living area less than the minimum required in a zoning district. Which is? And so it's um, dependent on the zoning district and it's permitted in five zoning districts the r2 r3 which are both of those are multifamily, rmh1 and rmh2 which are the mobile home park and mobile home um, district and then the umu the uh, urban mixed use zoning district say that again you, <laughs> especially about the rmh okay so Again, this is tiny house. A right, definition right. for tiny house is a detached residential unit home with a living area less than the minimum required in a zoning district. So each zoning district has a minimum for the living space. Um, and so the five zoning districts where a tiny house is permitted is in R2 and R3. Both of those are the city's multifamily zoning districts. RMH1 and RMH2 mobile home districts and then the urban mixed use, which is the area to the west of downtown. Well, with the exception of, um, where is that? And the difference between what we're talking about tonight, ADUs and tiny homes, tiny homes would be, that would be the only principal structure on the lot, whereas an accessory dwelling unit is accessory to an existing principal structure. So there's already- I understand all that, oh, okay. but what's stopping it though? What's stopping you? I mean, is there an ordinance that says you can only have, you can't have uh, ADUs on tiny home lots? Teeny <laughs> <laughs> tiny. Well, it's they could it could be the, uh, virtually the same size as the ADU. Wow. Well, I mean, it's a tiny a home. There's a 25% limit of the. Okay. A quarter of whatever the tiny home is, the tinier well, home. Well, this right. is a so, discussion. Thank you very much. I just need to know. Does city attorney need to add something for clarification? Uh, what about it? Are you looking at the agenda? 
tiny home ordinance. Okay. The tiny home ordinance mm -hmm. has a requirement that it's a development on a minim minimum two acre site with a minimum of five residential dwelling units with front doors facing and abutting a centralized common area. So it's a developmental code rather than if you wanna just have one tiny home, that's not what this code allows. So it's for- I'm sure it's not. And this code was created in 2021 for like pockets of having tiny homes in one centralized development area. I understand what you're saying, but I'm, I, for some strange reason, I see someone saying who has a tiny home saying, oh, I want to put another one on in my backyard or on the side of my house or something like that. And they're going to come before um, the, um, um, the, well, not us probably, but they were coming before the, um, uh, no, no, the uh, other one where they board of adjustment litigate. and appeals. Yes, I know. Well, for what it's worth, I haven't experienced um, any requests for tiny homes since the adoption of the ordinance. That's weird because I, I heard some people say, "Oh, I would love to have a tiny home," but if I guess it takes a, a development to do it, even no one wants to do it on their own. Huh? Well, if, if I may, so one of the issues with, with tiny homes right now, which I'm glad you guys brought that up is that you're going to take two acres and build only five units yeah. for a tiny home when that really should be reserved to one acre. So you can get more homes and more value from a developer standpoint out of two acres than putting five tiny homes. True. And so, and that was, would be my next question is why are, why is there a minimum requirement of two acres for five tiny homes? That, that just seems there's a lot of space between those homes when we don't even allow bigger homes to have that much space between, between them. So a lot size is just, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. I think we're off topic, Mr. Faison. Oh, no. Although this is important. Next, I'm gonna call on Ms. Gilbert, please. Um, I wanted to point out that on C1G, it also says that at least one, but no more than two off street parking spaces shall be provided for the accessory dwelling unit. So that might have an impact on like mobile homes, being able to use it for that. Does staff want to comment on that? Uh, well, currently, the accessory dwelling unit section does it does not permit accessory dwelling units in either RMH one or RMH two. But that is a consideration if you were to recommend approval uh, for council to change to allow those districts to have accessory dwelling units. Thank you, M Member Alton. Um, so I had a couple. One, you know, the um, seems like the page two that council pointed out it says in Indian River City there's a minimum of 600 square feet and the other party ordinance says it's a maximum of 600 square feet so 599 or 601 is disallowed seems like there's definitely a uh, an, an issue there uh, if you're trying to do this in Indian River City so I, I mean, I would suggest, I think uh, the minimum and the maximum should, should probably go up and, and perhaps even the percentage, but you know, we've been focusing on the smaller side, but you know, there's, there's also, um, you know, as, as these bigger companies come in on the economic development side for, you know, corporate homes and executive homes, things like that, where a um, 4,000 square foot house limiting them to 600 square feet for the guest house, pool house, accessory dwelling, you know, whatever it might be, um, might be, might be restrictive. Now, if, if at that case, the, you know, if you just purely went with the 25%, you'd be up to a thousand square feet on a, on a 4,000 square foot house. My other question was related to the off street parking. Are there zoning districts that are either perhaps either grandfathered in or um, existing where there either is no off street parking or there's only one off street parking required in the subdivision and therefore you would the, the factor that an accessory you know adds an additional off street parking site you just that limits it to the point where you just couldn't do the unit because there is isn't enough parking spaces that's certainly possible that they could uh, not have enough room to provide the required parking. And since they can't meet the limitations, it would not be permitted 
Um, as far as whether there had been a previous accessory dwelling unit prior to this code, um, that they are now being asked to meet this code, they could apply for a vested rights process to say that they had previously had the accessory dwelling unit uh, in compliance with the code, and, and so there's a process for that. Um, but as far as any type of grandfathering, this ordinance doesn't include yeah. any grandfathering. So. I mean, it, it seems like perhaps changing off-street parking to legal parking or something like that um, might be a, a better term because I, I assume there's areas where it's perfectly legal to park on the street in front of your house, but this says off-street parking seems, seems very limiting. Is that something, staff, is that something that needs to be considered? Absolutely. It sounds like another idea for how to make accessory dwelling units more attainable. Any, anything you can do to re, um, re, relieve some of the limitations, I think, would, would reduce those barriers. Member Richardson. Um, I was just thinking, as um, Member Aton was talking, some of the lots <clears throat> in, in in New River City that were developed before it became a part mm -hmm. of Titusville are non-conforming lots that were grandfathered in. I think that's why in River City has a different size requirement than the rest of Titusville. Uh, because even now you see lots um, that have wanted to expand the existing house on a lot that is uh, below the minimum lot size. It goes before uh, adjustments and appeals, I watch it uh, about six months ago. So <clears throat> I understand why some of the lots in the River City area um, are 600 square feet. But <clears throat> I would say again that we should really look at the uh, uh, reducing the 400 minimum to about 250 as uh, Member Faison suggested. Minimum. Any additional questions from commissioners? Clerk, what cards do we have on this issue, please? Uh, one card, Stan Johnston. Mr. Johnson. Excuse me? Thank you. Do any commissioners have an additional question or concern? Mr. Anton. So, Obviously, this was prompted. Is is there a any feedback? It, it, it'd be more, I guess, you on the personal versus um, the the whole department. But is there like a common factor amongst people coming in and wanting to do it, where they're denied that maybe we're missing or or something that the reason people aren't able to do it, and therefore there's this request. No, I wish that I had uh, some, some better feedback for you on what could make this easier, but we just haven't had a lot of interest in it. And I don't know if it's because people aren't aware that it's allowed to some degree um, with the limitations. So maybe it takes uh, on the part of the city doing some kind of education or uh, communication that, hey, this is allowed. You're, if you're interested, you, you could have this, uh, you have this option available to you. Um, but no, I haven't heard of a, a lot of people requesting this and then not being able to meet the limitations. There just doesn't seem to be strong demand for it right now, which is also kind of unusual because with the price of housing, you would think that any way that we can add additional living space um, and help with the affordability crisis right now, that um, that this would be moving a little faster, but I'm not seeing uh, strong demand for it. So you, you, you bring up a point. It seems like there might be on this small of a unit, similar to kind of the tiny house thing. What separates a mobile home slash travel trailer from a modular dwelling 80 I mean the, is this stick build on a foundation and is that somewhere else in the code or or from an ordinance standpoint or could this be a pre-built mod factory built home that's then transported in and set in place uh, but still meets the whatever requirements end up be becoming the final piece of this. Sure. The difference lies in the um, 
the codes that it meets. So a modular structure is built in a factory, but it still meets the Florida building code. A travel trailer or mobile home has an FDOT number and is met, meets a different spec, doesn't meet the Florida building code. Okay, so it could, it could be factory built as long as it meets Florida building code. Right, and that's the same with our residential districts. If you wanted to construct a, a modular single family home, as long as it meets the Florida building code, it can be approved. Okay. Member Grant. I'm sorry, Eddie, did I, did I understand you correctly? Um, manufactured homes, I believe is uh, in the RMH district, am I, am I correct in that? So the RMH, I believe RMH uh, uh, it encompasses um, mobile homes and manufactured homes. It does. RMH stands for residential housing, and the purpose of it is to establish suitable development of mobile homes and manufactured housing subdivision that is platted. But so it's a park with platted lots where the homes are are set up. And they're and they're permanent. Am I correct? Manufactured homes, not mobile, not mobile homes. Uh, You're on a permanent, permanent slab, am I right? I believe so, but I, I'm, I would have to ask the building official, the building department on that. Well, this is what I was trying to get to. I just didn't articulate it right about whether um, the uh, ADU should be allowed in the uh, RMH district or not. Because I know manufactured home, it mentioned manufactured homes in that district, and that's... Uh, food for thought. Did you receive an answer, Mr. Grant? Oh, okay. Maybe Mr. Richardson has a question or an answer. Separate question, I guess, for Chelsea. Um, should we make a motion that council consider certain aspects of change to this ordinance, or do we just consensus ask them to look at it? What do you think we should do? I would request that one of the members make a motion that specifically addresses the topics you would like council to amend in the code and then staff will prepare an agenda item for council and then that basically would work as advisability for council to direct staff to work on the topic if they think it's appropriate or to say no if they don't think it's appropriate so a motion are these are those considered conditions or just considerations? No, this is a, rec this recommendation, is a, a recommendation to, council. to city council, and okay. you're going to specify whatever things that you would like them to look at. Perfect. Or to direct staff to look at. Mr. Faison, do you need to add something? I will make the motion. Yes, sir. I'm like, let's call for the motion. Um, so I'm calling for a motion on item 9A, extensive. Sensory dwelling units, please. Mr. Faison. I move that we recommend to council that they take a look at dwelling size, minimum and maximum, as well as the requirement for setbacks and parking. And parking, yes. Are there any other recommendations besides dwelling size, setbacks on the lot, and parking? Member Riley. I would also say, based on what Mr. Faison has said, uh, ask them to provide a copy of the Palm Bay Ordinance so that can be reviewed. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Do I have a second on Member Faison's? A uh, second for discussion and perhaps a friendly amendment. The more I look at the Indian River City restrictions, like share shall share a common wall including roof of the commercial structure which i don't get that either um 
maybe I I don't know whether we need to consider making the Indian River or maybe it's just review the Indian River neighborhood um, section for consistency with the rest of the ordinance I think would probably be the way to put it does member Richardson have anything to add because you have the historic perspective on the Indian yeah, River do you think that does it? That is an outstanding, friendly amendment to the motion. If Member Faison agrees. Member Faison. Oh, I agree. So I have a second. I have yes, all the recommendations. Second. Recommendations complete. Do we need to review the verbiage again? We're okay, Member Faison? I think we nailed it. Excellent. Okay. Uh, clerk. Two, we have, can you uh, do a roll call vote, please? Member Riley? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Childs? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Faison? Yes. Chairwoman Spidell? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, moving right along to item 9B, Tranquility Shores, phase two, sketch plat. Staff, please. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Item 9B begins on page 10 of 37, tonight's agenda. Tranquility Shores, formerly Antigua Bay, phase two, is a proposed 102 lot single family subdivision on approximately 39.374 acres located north of State Road 405 and east of South Washington Avenue. This is the second phase of the overall project which consists of approximately 345 acres. The City Council approved the original development agreement with Master Plan for the Antigua, Antigua Bay project in 2017. The Master Plan includes single-family home lots at the north of the property, both multifamily and commercial zone property, recreational amenities such as a public boardwalk and walking trails, and open space. The submittal requirements for a sketch plat are listed in Section 11 of the Development Review Procedures Technical Manual. On the subsequent pages, page 11, through 12, we have the um, review criteria, and if it's helpful, I can explain the platting process if the commission needs a little background on, on what we're looking for tonight. What questions do we have from for commissioners to staff right at this point? Do you need time to review that? Yes, no? Okay. Member Riley? Is, is this the same development that uh, Dwight Sievers spoke to us about at the, at the last meeting? It is part of the same master development. Uh, the concern was on the eastern edge, which is technically phase one, and this is phase two, which is to the west. Okay, so this, this, this is not the same land then that we talked about at the last meeting? Correct. It's not on the shoreline. Okay. So this is phase two only? Correct. Mr. Sievers raised a flag on phase one. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions? Are there any cards on this item, please? Yes, I have three cards. Um, Rodney Honeycutt. Mr. Honeycutt. Did you want to go first? One hundred South Washington Avenue in Titusville. Uh, so we're here tonight requesting that you um, recommend approval to City Council for Phase 2 of Tranquility. As um, staff explained, it's um, 102 lots on approximately 40 acres, slightly less than 40 acres, and it includes an access to US-1. Uh, phase 1 had an access on State Road 405. And so now phase two, which will exceed 100 lots, requires um, a second access. So there is an access to US-1, and that access is not just a straight access. It, it follows the master plan out to uh, US-1. The access is a split median four-lane highway, um, and... Um, yeah, it has a traffic circle in it that's a few hundred feet back from the road uh, that has been reviewed with DOT to make sure that that's in the proper area um, to allow a proper traffic move through the site. 
Uh, we have adequate water, adequate sewer. Uh, the stormwater for all the lots were uh, treatment was provided in phase one. Uh, there will be some additional for um, the uh, road that goes out to US one in this phase. And so uh, this is sketch plat. The next step is we have to submit engineering plans and preliminary plat. And so we need approval so we can move forward. And if I, you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer. I'd like a question. I'd like to ask a question to make sure that I can remember your presentation and whether this involved phase one or phase two. And I thought there was a spirited discussion concerning the location of multifamily dwellings. There is, there is no multifamily in this. Wasn't there? A, no. There is, no, there's no, no multifamily. These are all in single this, family. We haven't displaced any. No, there's. Okay, so this is the same thing you originally proposed for phase two, and that it, the first presentation. Yes. Okay. Member Richardson, please. Uh, as I recall, is this involving the same phase that we had to change the roundabout because there wasn't an agreement with Florida DOT? This, the roundabout, that's what I mentioned briefly, the roundabout is moved f further east from US-1 to allow more traffic back up and that development agreement amendment number three and the end of September last year, I think, addressed that. What questions do we have from commissioners to um, Mr. Honeycutt? Member Faison. Mr. Honeycutt, I got a question for you. And this is really my tiny house thing again, all right? <laughs> what size lots are your are these lots for these full size homes? They're generally 70 by 125, I think. 125 or 30. So that's less than a quarter of an acre, right? Yes. Wow, tiny houses need a third of an acre. <laughs> Need to review that tiny home ordinance. <laughs> Mr. Faison is interested in tiny houses. You don't anticipate the construction of any tiny houses within <laughs> phase two. Just the anticipation. No, I don't. Not at all. Oh, okay. Just just a thought. What about those mother in law? Places, um, granny flats. No, no anticipation of any of that this time. No. And looking at the size of the lots, this really would not be acceptable to a guest house or a pool house for residents, would it? Um, I, I'm not sure. Certainly, you could have a pool, and so it would depend on the minimum size. But there's there's been no mention of that. Mentioned by whom? by anyone and nobody's ever said i want a pool house on this project no a and i want my mother-in-law to live there <laughs> not on this project that i'm that i'm made the record reflect that's right <laughs> <laughs> that it has been mentioned okay thank you thank you <laughs> what do you want <laughs> what do you want you want you want a recreation room for your children okay sure. occupancy permit required uh, staff please I, I just had one um, comment I wanted to point out that on the cover sheet which is page 13 of 37 there's a section that describes the lot requirements and setback requirements and there's two columns in that section one column is what the code requires and then one column is what is being proposed and for the most part the what's being required what's being proposed matches what's being required there's a couple of exceptions like the side yard setback requirement where it's required to have a five foot minimum and what's being proposed is a seven and a half foot minimum um, i would just want the commission to understand that if this sketch plat is approved um, with this cover sheet um, as shown that what's shown as proposed would then be what is and this is for the applicant as well um, what if if this if you recommend approval as presented tonight and city council were to adopt this then the standard shown in the proposed column would be adopted and we would hold the the plat to the proposed standards so i would recommend if the applicant is not interested in, in that if that was just supposed to be informational only to show how they're meeting and exceeding the code that to go ahead and remove the proposed column 
Um, otherwise, if it remains, uh, and you can also make that recommendation that if council were to approve this, that they remove that section. Um, and so just, just a, an additional food for thought, I wanted to point out that section on the cover sheet. Again, that's page 13 of 37. Do any commissioners have a question concerning that point by staff? I don't have a question, but I, I do want to. Member facing. I do want to commend um, them for having 70 foot frontage. Um, I, I think that's, I'm kind of tired of seeing 50 foot frontage. So, so thank you for at least having 70 foot frontages. This is for the planting of the crepe myrtles, is that correct? Just checking. Member Alton. Is, is there any comment from the applicant as it relates to their preference is the adoption of the seven and a half foot setback versus the five foot setback? I think that. Um, just to introduce yourself, just for the record for me, please. Uh, Gary Allen. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And um, yeah, I, th I think that in our. Um, in our covenants and restrictions that we were going to go with the, uh, the seven and a half uh, for for this phase. So I think that's consistent with, uh, with what we want, even though it's beyond uh, what's required. And one more point beyond the, uh, the side yard, because there is one other section that doesn't match. Um, the required for a minimum building pad, there is no minimum requirement for a building pad size. And what's being proposed is 55 foot by 70. So in the future, um, if a building pad were proposed that were smaller than that, we would say it's inconsistent with the plat. And so I would want to make sure that, that is okay as well. Um, and it, <laughs> <laughs> again, you can make that part of your recommendation or allow it. Uh, the applicant could request the city council make that change as well. So just something I wanted the applicant to be aware of. Mr. Honeycutt. Yes. So that. Um, I'm pretty sure that 50 by uh, 55 by 70 is the maximum building pad. I think you can get on that size lot. And so that's, could, that's still we could add the words maximum 13. and it would be okay. And that's still ch chart 13 on, of 37. Yes, ma'am. Page 13 of 37. It's uh, towards the center right of the sheet. It says lot requirements and there's two columns required and proposed. It says minimum building pad, 55 feet by 70 feet under proposed. Any additional so, comments? So we would we would ask that you uh, that we would remove that if that becomes yeah. a requirement, just because it's approved. Okay. I've never had that said before that you it's have to have an exact building pad on a site. Okay. Right, and as uh, as I mentioned in the required column, there is no requirement for a minimum building pad. Um, it was provided as additional information, but if it is approved with that on the cover, we would then use that as a standard. Thank you. So we don't want that to be. <laughs> is that it, Mr. Honeycutt? Yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Are there additional cards on this item? Mr. Allen, did you want to speak anymore? He has a card. No, I will. You're okay, Mr. Allen? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay. You're just here? I'm just here. Okay. And then uh, Stan Johnston is the last card on this item. Mr. Johnson. Uh, Stan Johnston. I am uh, not opposed to this project. Uh, and this is a sketch plat. Uh, I'm, I'm commenting about sketch plat. If you'll notice is that... Uh, uh, the, the, the sheets that were presented by Honeycutt and Associates, they're not signed and sealed. They're not signed and sealed. But in uh, the sketch, sketch plat for uh, SNJ Oaks, they had signed and sealed plans. They had a, like, looked like a preliminary plat that was signed and sealed. Um, I believe that Mr. Honeycutt did it properly, and that is to not to sign a preliminary design signed seal design, but uh, uh, SNJ Oaks uh, was signed and sealed. Uh, there's some differences that, are, that, are, that keep on coming up uh, about what's going on with your sketch plats. 
uh, in this case is that uh, in SNJ Oaks, uh, there's a, uh, a city approved an eight foot wide driveway for uh, uh, accessing uh, houses and lots, dead end street, one way, eight foot. That's what the city of Titusville approved. And I cannot get uh, anyone from city manager or anyone to respond to that issue. Can't get them to respond about the survey that has, has all kinds of errors in it as far as distances and angles in a disagreement with city surveys and everybody else survey that I know in the world. Uh, I can't get responses to uh, uh, water flows downhill. They've got a, uh, they have a structure that uh, water can't enter. Uh, they, they've, uh, they've even taken the word Mockingbird Lane, which is on, on uh, city street maps. It's on the um, uh, postal records. It's on uh, property appraisers records, and it's been erased. It's erased from the survey, not the city survey, not other surveys, but it's, it's on the city surveys, but it's not on this survey, and it's not even on the plat. And the city, along with the city, the engineer of record, has, has claim, claims that, that the properties that are on Mockingbird Lane have no legal access and are landlocked. I used to own that property. I didn't claim that. So right now, as the city is, is uh, let's say they're... Uh, we call it uh, not responding, and I don't think that's right. And uh, so I'm coming to you, letting you know that it's, there's still a problem. It's been about a year and a half now. The problem still remains. City hasn't solved it. You still got the problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any comment from com <laughs> commissioners, please? Let me remind you that item 9B focuses on Tranquility Shores, phase two, sketch plat. Do I have a motion, please? Oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna close the public hearing on that. Now, do I have a motion? On item 9B, Tranquility Shores, Phase two, sketch plat. Member uh, Anton. I'll um, make a motion to approve uh, Tranquility Shores phase two sketch plat uh, with the modification of, um, I guess, the deletion of the minimum or, or of the yeah, minimum or the building, any reference to a minimum on the building pad size. Do I, do I have a second on that motion? Member Faison. I second. Any discussion? Call for a vote. Roll call vote, please. Secretary Grant? Yes. Member Riley? Yes. Member Faison? Yes. Member Childs? Yes. Vice Chairman Richardson? Yes. Member Aton? Yes. Chairwoman Spidell? Yes. Thank you very much. Moving on to item, what happened to 10? It just disappeared. I'm not a math teacher, but. Item 10 is pet uh, petitions and requests from public present and press. Oh, that's right. Okay, sorry about that. Petitions and requests from the public present, please. We have one card. Stand. Do we have a card, please? Mr. Yes. Johnston, do you have a card for petitions and requests from the public present, sir? Uh, Stan Johnston, I'm a registered professional engineer. I used to work for the city, used to work for the county. And uh, I'm uh, reporting to you about something that is concerned, should be a concern of all citizens of the city of Titusville. On October 11th and October the 25th, we, there, was, there was two separate council meetings, and at those council meetings, our city manager was dishonest, horribly dishonest. He claimed that we didn't have a uh, sewage spill after October, after December the 9th, 20, 2020. 
and mm -hmm. we certainly did. We have a lot of it. I mean, we got pictures and, and uh, videos and all kinds of uh, witnesses and so forth. He also claimed that the sewage spill that, that uh, reported by a number of people on October the 1st that went into nine city streets, he said it didn't happen. Uh, I want you to know that this, this involves all of us, uh, is that I've gone to numerous uh, attorneys, some very expensive attorneys that didn't charge me anything for some advice, and, and they said there's nothing I can do about it, not a thing I can do about it. And I've done that for years. Uh, the, uh, uh, however, uh, just uh, last month I read Florida Statutes 838.022. I believe that's it, and that has to do with false reports. False reports uh, have sounds like I cannot do it by the first part of it says it says that that uh, uh, false reports you can't do false reports that uh, you're economically economically advantaged you know you, you get some money or something like that, and that's what the attorneys always told me said I've got to show a transaction of money to stop to stop this, but then it says or if it's unhealthy or unsafe. And that's what we have. The uh, uh, violation of this statute is a felony. And that's what uh, I can say is that, you know, I've called this, this our city manager, I've called him a shyster, a con artist, and so forth. I've called him that because that's what he is. I know it personally. I know it personally. I don't have any problem calling him that, but I know I have a lot of people that do not like that. But that's what we have. And we're, we're, it seems like we're stuck with it. Council won't do a thing about it. But he's dishonest about this, and I think you all should think about what's going on. That sewage spill, sewage spill went into nine city streets. I reported to FDEP. I made a police report. I got all kinds of videos and so forth. Not just videos, photos, and other and witnesses. Nine city streets, and he said it never happened. So this is what we got. I'd like you all to uh, just tr try to be truthful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And staff, I need clarification on um, item 11A, semi annual report to, to the city council. Yes, ma'am, 11A. Uh, so we've drafted your semi annual report uh, twice per year. The PNZ is required to submit uh, a status update of all that you've worked on uh, for the past six months to city council. And so we've drafted this report. Um, if you'll look at page 35 of 37, just as an example under small scale amendments, SSA, it's number two towards the bottom of the page. Again, that's page 35. Uh, some of the items are listed multiple times. And if you read the, um, the full paragraph behind it, you'll notice that some of them are related to the change to the land use as opposed to the change to the zoning. So it, it has the same case number. For example, in this case, it's SSA number two, 2020, the cottages. It's repeated twice. The first is because you reviewed the ordinance changing the comp plan, and the second is the change to the zoning ordinance. Um, so if, if it seems repetitive, that's why. But this is our proposed draft to you, and so you can make changes. And then we'd also ask, the city clerk's office always asks if you'd like to send this as written, or if you would volunteer a member to come present this to the next city council meeting. What's the desire of the commissioners, please? I'm going to be at the council meeting. Well, that's something else. Let's stick. Let's stick with this, okay? Because I got a little post-it note on the other. Okay, so somebody needs to come and read this. Again, it's not necessary. You can submit the report as written. Do um, I need a motion? Um, I don't believe so. It can just be a general consensus. Okay. What discussion do commissioners have concerning the semi-annual report to city council about planning and zoning? Yeah, I agree. Does that need to be voted upon? Just discussion? No, ma'am. Okay. I'll forward that recommend. Member okay. Faison, do you, do as, you have a comment, uh, sir? As, devil, as the devil's advocate, and yes, by sir. all means... Are you going to talk about tiny houses on this? <laughs> <laughs> just going to just put that in there. Uh, I am not your guy. But okay. however, it, it, it would make a good face of this advisory board to 
to present this as, uh, as as a presentation to the council, but again from a more senior individual than yourself. You brought it up, ma'am. Uh, no, <laughs> not from. I'm just. Uh, the, the Have optics. you raised your hand, Mr. No, ma'am. I'm. Uh, <laughs> So you want the oldest member <laughs> to present it? Will there be a... Why don't we have Officer Willie Taylor present it to us? I think that's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, nope, <laughs> from the public. Present as written. Does the chair need to present this as a handoff or a suggestion that this be digitally presented? No, ma'am, there's no requirement for you to present this. Okay, thank you. So it seems to be the consensus minus one, Mr. Faison, that this be a handoff to city council. Are there any conditions to this? Seeing none? Point of order. I would, I would like to make a comment here that the way that this item is drafted in the agenda should actually read that you are going to receive the report and if any action is taken aside from presenting it to city council then i would recommend that you receive cards before you take any action but if no action is going to be taken then you are just simply receiving this item and not taking any action and moving on to the next item correct so no action is being taken in this case thank you mr johnston There are lots of things that we don't like in life. So it is the recommendation of this com of all commissioners to hand this over to City Council. Yes. Yes. How about that? Not about Thank you. City staff, additional requests, petitions, or requests? Uh, no additional reports from staff, ma'am. Thank you. City Attorney. Yes, as Member Richardson, uh, sorry, Vice Chair Richardson previously stated, the, there are certain members that term expires at the end of this month. I can go through them if you'd like. At the, the conclusion of this month, the city clerk will reach out to y'all that are up for reappointment to find out what your wish and pleasure is, which you don't need to make public at this time. Um, but I will say that your bylaws do state that there's going to be an election of officers at the February meeting, our next meeting. So just keep that in mind and um, do try to attend so that we can have a full body voting on the election of officers at your next meeting. Okay. And so council is going to make the appointments at their meeting next week, as I understand. No, that's not correct. They go on the agenda after the term is up. Okay. According to our color-coded, excellently designed, thank you, Mr. Eddy, yes, and I clerk, think it was, uh, thank you, Lori. beautifully. I, I can't take credit Lori, for it. That beautiful. was Lori. February 8th will be the next planning and zoning meeting. Be here, please. Do, and, the, and be um, advised by the clerk before January 31st, whether you need paperwork to reapply. Is that correct, Council? No, the clerk will reach out to you to find okay. out what your intention is. Excellent. Thank you very much. And reply in a prompt fashion. Yes, ma'am. Member Richardson, comment, please. Um, I just have one. Uh, Brad sent us, or maybe you did, this development review sheet, these two sheets. Um, where I've been told there were 16 um, site plan, they're working on 16 different site plans, and it looks more like 30. Um, and I just have one question. I'll take the one under Culver's, which is acceptable to me, not a Zaxby's or Chick-fil-A's, at least at Culver's. There's, <laughs> They have the site plan under review, and then underneath it, they have Culver's Minor Division. What is that? It's repeated a couple of times here. What's a minor division and what's a regular? 
So what that's intended to uh, document is the non-residential minor division that's happening at that property. And what that is is similar to the wedge, which is the, intersect the northeast intersection of Highway 50 and South Street 405, uh, where the Cumberland Farms is yeah. and Discount Tire. Um, so that whole site is governed by one master site plan, but the individual parcels are split off um, in order to be the building pads to be sold. And so at the Culver site, there's additional land that is also being uh, site planned at the same time. U utilities are being considered and there's a um, uh, development proposal for the portion of the property to the west. Okay. Um, I'm still concerned at the number of site plans that are under review and if there's adequate staff to meet the demands. Um, have you ha have y'all hired anybody lately? We are still in the interviewing process. We had uh, an interview today actually and we have another one tomorrow. Um, so we're still trying to get to full staff and then um, there's always the opportunity to add additional staff but um, from my perspective, we are we have never been this busy before, and, and that's just not not my own perspective. I've been here eight years now. There are some more senior members of the staff who have been here more than 15 years who say that it is just beyond what we've ever experienced. So the city is uh, very busy right now, and we're also down staff members. So if you hear some complaints from from outside applicants, uh, it, it it is taking longer than usual right now. Well, I know that you can't act for bad. But certainly, get some. They can get some staff on. They're retired or that are familiar with the site review process. And uh, definitely. So, for example, we I have. I understand that you're overworked. Mm -hmm. um, so Tim Ford, who recently retired, um, he still helps us on contract with some of the downtown, um, and whoever we hire for that position, um, Tim will help train so that we can hit the ground running with that new applicant. Even if you get Peggy back <laughs> part time, I think she's still rafting. <laughs> <laughs> Member Grant. At the uh, recent special council meeting, I think it was this past Thursday, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, part of that, they were talking about the community block grants, and a part of that, they were talking about. The beautification of South De Leon. Now that triggered something in my mind because approximately two years ago, plus or minus a few months, I was at a council meeting here and some gentlemen were talking about purchasing the old Williams apartments or whatever and oh they had a nice spiel but I haven't heard anything else about it. The place is an eyesore and it's a safety hazard. We used to run a lot, run into a lot of safety hazard uh, properties when I was part of, um, um, what was that uh, thing we were part of, Joe? Yeah, uh -huh, code enforcement. Yeah. Uh, do you know if anything is going on with that? Is that the one that was uh, sold as a condo and half the condo owners live in? Europe. So that place has been under construction now. If you drive by there now, it's been gutted, and there are people that are working there feverishly for the last few. And I know weeks at least. I don't. I couldn't go beyond weeks, but they've that place has been cleaned up. It's been gutted, and they are now in the process of remodeling that. That no. It's so it's it, it was called Old Williams Apartments. It's on the right. Leon, um, between where that S curve is, where people hang out, play loud music, between there and the barbershop, Queen Street on the right hand side yeah well, depending on which way you go so anyways but it, it, it so for the longest time 15 20 years or so it's been abandoned yeah. and just been deteriorating and like remember Richard said uh it was sold as condos to folks who didn't live in Florida it was it was a they, they lost their money um and then there was this this water bill one million dollar water assessment that was signed to it that made it hard for any local investors to get it the city, I guess, did something with that $1 million assessment, water assessment, and allowed an investor to get it. So uh, recently, there have been, they've been people, to your question, uh, there have been people that's been remodeling that Very now. Good. Nice report. Thank you, Mr. Faison. Member Riley. My term is going to be up uh, January 31st, and I just wanted to 
tell everyone here that I've been very honored to serve for the last two years and three months on this board, either as an alternate or a regular member. But I've decided it's time to step away. I have other things, other organizations that I belong to and I'm working hard at. And I really don't have the time to, to overextend myself to, to stay on here. So I want to say thank you to the staff, uh, Attorney Chelsea Farrell and Eddie Galindo and all the others, Brad, uh, that you do a great job every night that we meet. And I appreciate it. And I know that sometimes there's criticism. And I want to say that I hope you realize that's constructive criticism, that for the most part, we know that you do a great job and that you are really here for, for the city of Titusville. I want to say the same thing about the commissioners. Uh, what I've noticed, this is not an, an easy job. Uh, you can't just come to the meeting. You have to review hundreds sometimes of documents. And sometimes we have meetings, maybe the, the city doesn't know that, but our, sometimes our meetings last for hours. Sometimes the entire audience is filled. And the reason that we've done so well, I believe, in the last year is because we have Jane Spidell, and she's a terrific uh, lead to our commission. And I've never seen anybody that can handle over 90 people in the audience not lose her cool, treat every single person with dignity. And as, as a final thing I want to say, and Joe Richardson is a phenomenal person. I believe he's the heart of this commission. And I also extend my thanks to all of you because everyone has put in good efforts. And I want to say thank you and not goodbye because I'll see you in Publix uh, <laughs> or maybe Target. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riley. I move that Thank you Member for Riley reconsider her decision. I, I have the floor, and that's what I'm talking about, too. <laughs> Ma'am. Um, on the 31st, you need to make this decision, but it's, I think I can. I'm not a math teacher, but you had a couple of more days to uh, reconsider this. Um, Member Riley has really offered a valuable insight into every meeting we've had. Thank you so much. Um, and um, you can always back out of this. You know, there's nothing. Eating crow is a honorable move. Um, I have a report and just a very brief thing. It's a thanks to staff, please, especially. And would you carry this forward to Brad? Um, we had a, a presentation on tranquility phase one. And it was, um, and we received uh, some excellent print material to answer uh, both the visual presentation, the graphics, and the situation concerning that property. It was uh, received in a very prompt manner. I know you guys are busy, but uh, we needed some answers to pass along too. And so, could you tell Brad, thank you for that? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Member Richardson? Yes, I just want to add that I think Kathy Riley has been an exceptional member. And I think all of the members now, we're not only a good working group, uh, we, we, respect, we respect each other. And um, I wish you'd reconsider too. Um, She's got a couple of more days. We have a hot you can take yeah, so something, so, some. Um, thank you, everyone, for tonight's presentation. We're not on record time, but thank you anyway. And I will call an adjournment of the January 18th planning and zoning meeting. See you in February. Get your